Okay, we're going to start the speakers forum. If you have a question, please come up and grab this microphone. Just form a line up here and then put the microphone back down when you're done. And the speakers get to pass this microphone around. So if you have a question, please come up here and grab the microphone. And I'm, I'm, I'm wanted you guys to maybe think of medical doctors and what we should be doing to, you know, you know, ascertain whether the kinds of things you guys were talking about need to be done. And what I have is heartburn, tongue size, look for the frenulum, um, belching from the air breathing, doing oximetry. I have an oximetry in my office, but I only like do it in certain occasions. I'm thinking I ought to be all be doing that on every single chronic fatigue type case. Um, airway size, tight lips while swallowing, lip tape. Um, look for resting mouth breathing and look do the uh, airway x-rays, which I'd like to know how you order those. Uh, is there anything that you can think of right off the top that I should add to that list? Uh, treat your own children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and learn from that, I think, really important. But um, you hit it, posture, maybe, you had a neck posture. Oh, yeah, that thing like that, yeah, okay. Sleep, sleep position. And on the posture, the, the, the forehead should line up with the chin. Is that how that, the ear should, should, like should a, a ten, line a, up with a 10 the, degree angle or something? The earlobes should line up with the middle of the shoulder. Oh, really? Okay. Right. The head, if you, from here straight to the floor, uh, when they're looking straight ahead, it should go through the middle of their shoulder. You'll see so many of them will be forward like this. And then the, the crazy one is, believe it or not, we should have a vertical forehead, but of course nobody does. They're like this. They're all sloped back because that, again, advances the chin. So you think someone's got a sloped back forehead. No, their head is tilted that much and think of what that's doing back here and all the muscles that get it in that position. Uh, lip apart posture, what we call the accentuated cupid's bow, goes up like this and then down. Or the lip up here in the middle part is very high and down here. And a flaccid lower lip that's rolled out like this. Wow. That, like that, that. A flaccid lower lip that's rolled out is just very common. Flat cheeks, flat cheeks, and then the, the farther back the chin is, the worse it is. Uh, those are easy. Yeah, the the flat of it. If you if you draw a, a tangent from the to the no, to the nose here, and then you draw a tangent from the lower eyelid to the cheeks, the closer that is to being parallel, the more attractive the face. The more vertical that it is, because the ch the cheek is back, it's just indicating a, a really, really flat maxilla. Sometimes you'll even see. White under the iris, between the iris and the lower eyelid, that's a maxilla that's really collapsed. And it's, they're not attractive, but it really, those people almost always have big airway issues going on. You could also look at the palate. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, look at the palate, see if it's collapsing. If it's like big narrow, enough, like that. narrow or shaped. Not round, but shaped kind of a wedge shape. And uh, ask the patient, where does your tongue rest? Because you're an MD, I'm going to give you a really good, another good, and I'm, I'm playing a little bit. When you get those chronic fatigue women in, if they're 49, half my practice is 49, 50, and 51. In I'm, and I, I use that line, but it's true. If you look at your chronic fatigue patients, if they're 49, 50, or 51, and I say that little jokingly, remember that perimenopause, that's when the TMJ is going to have its second big hit. It's first in the high school and college, but that's also when they're going to start to get sleep apnea. That's also when sleep apnea is going to hit these women because the genioglossus receptor doesn't work as well. So, sorry about that. That's when the genioglossus, these receptors are going to start, stop working like they have for women of childbearing years. So if you have these chronic, those are two big hits, the TMJ hit and then the sleep apnea hit. So that's just a hint. That's estrogen, the, uh, estrogen, estrogen, estrogen related. Yes. Um, 
from a medical perspective too, I'd look at some of your patients um, who have unresolved inflammatory issues. So the, the people with adrenal fatigue that are, you know, doing all the appropriate things to manage cortisol during the day, there could be cortisol output uh, from sleep disorder breathing at night to help um, increase that oxygen saturation. Um, unresolved digestive issues. So if we're still seeing, um, you know, we're gluten-free, we're dairy-free, but we're also seeing a lot of nasal inflammation, you know, that could be potentially from mouth breathing or underdeveloped airway. Um, any other sort of unresolved inflammation, you know, especially in your practice that you've tried to treat with, with your methods, um, sometimes you can look towards um, that sleep disorder breathing, which would then lead to the development of the upper and lower jaw and all the things that they were describing. But um, a lot of times some of those unresolved medical issues that are coming in, you've just thrown everything at it. A lot of it comes, comes from the, the airway and the way they're breathing. Yeah, you know, listening to you guys talk this morning, I'm thinking that's like 85% of my people. Yeah, and, and I'm just missing it most of the time. Well, you know, the dentists ask their patients about their medical health, but I don't believe the medical community asks their, about their dental health. And there's such a correlation of cause and effect that we should be, if someone has a high dental disease rate, they probably have corresponding medical issues. Okay, thanks. Hello, my name is William Bieber. The big question that he just brought up is something that I've got a question to ask all of you, which is how do we better communicate to the medical community what it is that we're doing in biological dentistry? One of the big problems that I see in the community that I've just moved to is exactly this, that the physicians don't know what it is that we're doing. They don't understand what it is that we're doing. So I'm really anxious to find out how are you communicating to the physicians? How are you communicating to the chiropractors? And then the other question that I had is, I would really like to learn more about myofunctional uh, therapy and opportunity to get education in that realm. Well, I'll start the answer on that one. You start communicating and making relationships with the healthcare providers in your area. First thing you do is try and set up a lunch. If you can't set up a lunch, you send a mailer, but you write a hand-addressed envelope because people like me open the mail, and if it looks like form, it's in the trash. I would also definitely, definitely read the research that's out there because MDs, that's all they really, randomized controlled studies. We don't have a lot, but we have some. We have meta-analysis, we have some. And we just finished a Congress. We, I thought, I talked about the myofunctional people. We had 155 lectures. Uh, these two gentlemen were in on it, but we also had a lot of medical doctors doing it that are doing research and finding out because they too had sleep problems or they too had airway problems or their children had problems. And so the research is out there I included a whole packet of the latest studies that you should have in the, in the follow-ups. Um, I took a little bit more of a, a grassroots approach to it. So I just tried to identify with each medical provider who their biggest PIA patient was, who the biggest pain in the butt, and tried to solve that problem for them. So, um, for example, the, the ENT, I said, what do you do for your patients that need uh, repeat TNA surgery. Are you are you working on mouth breathing? No, I, I'd appreciate that referral um, to the the functional MD. What are you doing with your patient with adrenal fatigue who's not uh, getting resolution? Well, nothing. I'd, I'd appreciate that referral. Um, it got to the point where actually I presented at UT uh, Southwestern Green Rounds to a bunch of ENT residents because their approach was when the tongue was too big they were doing posterior tongue reductions. Um, and I was like, can I take a sales class from you? How do you convince a parent to commit to this treatment? But, you know, I, I, when I presented Grand Rounds, I, I simply said, hey, guys, maybe the tongue isn't too big. Maybe the lower jaw is too small, and that's pushing it back. And, okay, well, how do we make the jaw bigger? So that became potential referrals. The pediatrician, what do you do for the patients that um, 
you know, whose parents don't want to put them on medication for ADD, ADHD. Well, nothing. We have an argument every six months. I'd appreciate that referral. So really just find the bedwetter, for example. Um, so I, I tried to figure out, I know who my pain in the neck patients are. And, and so I know the ones that I don't want to treat. If I can refer those out to someone who will take care of them, I'm all for it. So really trying to recognize the chiropractor, another one. Uh, what do you do with the patients that have forward head posture and trigger points in the rhomboids that you can't resolve that are getting adjustments twice a week? I adjust them twice a week. Okay, maybe refer them over and we can we can work. To, I appreciate that referral. So once they start seeing, um, they'll send you their worst patients for sure at first. And then once they start seeing some sort of improvement or resolution or your approach to it, it can generate more referrals. And that's been the, the biggest um, practice builder for me personally is just... Um, identify what they don't want to do and how can you solve that problem for them. Right, and one of the biggest challenges and hurdles that I've seen for 20 years in this industry is that we use the word therapy a lot. Therapy is a never ending cycle. When you have something that can fix a problem, you're now cutting off a revenue source. And this is the biggest challenge. One of the reasons why I want to join this community is to be amongst like-minded individuals who recognize the need to, to cut this shit off. Pardon my French, but it needs to end. We need to start going after the physicians who are prescribing medications for everything. We need to start getting rid of amalgam out of dentistry completely. And Sorry to get on a soapbox here by any means, but it, it's time we, we step up as an organization, I would say, and make Hello. It's okay they do this for me when I talk uh, Red Pill stuff too anyway. I guess I'm done, but that that's really my question. The other one was uh, if someone could talk with regard to Myofunctional therapy, you know, again, this is something that I, I've not been a big fan of because it's therapy. Speech therapy, myofunctional therapy, when I say, okay, but here's the solution, here's how you fix the problem, then the answer is, well, I, I'm not referring to you. So I probably need to learn more how to talk the lingo, and my question is, how do I how do I do that? I'll address I'll address that, and then I'm going to hand the mic over to somebody who can give you a lot better answer than I can. But first, I want to address what you talked about earlier, and if you want to get more referrals, you need to change your mindset. You just got through answering some of your own questions. If you say, if I do so and so, it's going to cut off somebody's revenue. And these people ought to be taken to task. That's not going to get you there. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm talking in my daddy voice here, not my dentist voice. But I can tell you, it's not because I'm so wise, it's because I'm so old. And why, oh, age doesn't give a man wisdom. What gives a man wisdom are all the scuffs on his knees and his hands where he's hit, his, hit the ground and scuffed up his knees and abraded his face. So if you want to get somebody to get on your side, that's where you're going to make some progress. So you go to the physician and say, I need somebody to help me every now and then. And I just want to know if you'd like to be that person, a sleep doctor, a board certified sleep physician. And you say, I get people, I work a lot with people who have airway problems. And I tell you, it doesn't always work. And I need also to get a diagnosis because you can't make a, a, a medical diagnosis because sleep apnea is a medical diagnosis. And you say, look, I can see these people, but I need you. What do you think that'll make them feel like? Yeah, I can take care of that. Yeah, I can handle it. Because then you're offering something you can do for them. That'll get their attention. And then you say, also, if you get some of these kids that just aren't getting anywhere and you don't know what's going on, send them. That's, that's the kind of stuff I do. Uh, and uh, uh, just don't let it bother you. If, you. if you're done everything and they're just not getting better and their parents are getting worse, send them over. Because that's what I work on all the time. Then you're doing the same thing. It's your mindset. It's how you say it. 
And yeah, that's not a good reason for anybody to be doing amalgams, but not many people do. Uh, it's not worth the gut lining to worry about stuff like that. Think in terms of what you can do for them. Get enough of them on, and ask for cards and you'll use them. Now, I'm going to give this to somebody who can talk about the malfunction there. The, the big thing is the definition of therapy is making a change slowly over time. Too many doctors and dentists want a quick fix for everything. Slam bam, thank you, ma'am. Malfunctional therapy doesn't work that way unless you can get the mommies of little babies and teach them some basic education when they're really open to hearing about the importance of breastfeeding and, and habits and things and how it can affect their learning disabilities and behavior problems later because we all want a nice little Johnny or Susie so that that helps and also I try to teach my students to adopt the school in your area bring in lunch and learn go put it out there I used to give powerpoints to my students so they could go I just gave one to somebody that didn't Peter Ortho at UCLA, you know, adopt a school, go in and talk to them, talk to the students, the, the medical students, the dental students, Just open up their thinking a little bit on cause and prevention of disease. I just, I, I just want to support what Joy is saying here. And I hear what you're saying about therapy. It's like, you know, the the chiropractor who is going to have the patient come back forever and ever and ever. And I see a chiropractor. He's the reason I keep running. Uh, and, I, and I really believe in it. But your point of endless therapy is true. The, she showed a little Asian kid this morning who had ticks. And, you know, I expanded the crap out of him. She took care of the myo. His ticks went away. And there's an end point. Like, hey, it's done but it didn't, it's not easy to get there. His older brother was the same way, only he'd already had teeth taken out. He's, he's off in college now, no more ticks, everything. You can achieve an endpoint, but you gotta get the team of people. I don't wanna do myofunctional therapy. Why would I, when I got her? <laughs> but you, you, you assemble a team of people that you can hand off to, and, and, and you work collaboratively. Nobody, has, nobody knows it all. I come here, I listen to Stacy. Oh my God, I know he knows so much. I don't know what he knows, but I've known him for years. He's the, he knows tongue tie like crazy and a lot of other things. Get yourself a team like that. And, and don't stop with the first or second or third myofunctional therapist that bobbed out for you. There's a lot of good ones out there. You just gotta search and find them. And it doesn't matter whose course they took or how many certifications they have. You, there are good ones out there that are doing it for the right reason. To, uh, my addiction is getting people well. You know, it's just it's my addiction. And it should be everybody in healthcare, not just me. It's not about the, the money will come if you have the right attitude. You know, as a practitioner, I think all of us struggle with the following thing, which is, what do you do when your stuff doesn't work? And it happens a lot. A lot of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinical setting, sometimes the outcome is not so good. So I think that the challenge for us as practitioners is understanding how to network with others. I know in my area, for example, I'm near Duke University, about less than a half a mile from Duke. Some of the most well-known physicians and surgeons in the world live there. You asked a question earlier, how do you approach your physician colleagues? The vast majority of them that are traditionally trained, I don't think it's that they don't care about what we're doing. I think they just don't have time. And I think a lot of it is you've got to find the guys in your area that you're willing to work with and help you through these things. You don't, it doesn't do much good to lob mortar rounds in on them. That isn't going to help very much. Uh, we, I think that, the, again, the challenge is how do we manage patients like what these wonderful folks are doing 
in the face of the fact that you got to get to a level that we're happy, we've arrived at a place that we can live with. It's not what we wanted, but it's the best that we can do with what we have. We all need to just do the best we can. And we can promise our patients that we'll do the best we can for them and mean it, you know. And if it means collaboration with, you know, a, a therapist or a, you know, a, a, an occupational therapist or a speech pathologist or an orthodontist or whoever, you got to build a team of people a vision therapist we talked about you know I, there's so many things that we don't know you don't know what you don't know so you have to be awake and try to find an answer for your patients in every um, don't leave every stone and turn Michael there, there is a question for Dr. Fleming from the virtual audience I'll read it to you is there a safe distance to maintain from our cell phones and devices? This is from Dr. Marsha Rutledge. And her second question is, is, is it safer to use a speakerphone? Okay. Well, the safest distance would be probably Mars. <laughs> no, actually, uh, again, the subject of the presentation was cell phone radiation and its effect on, on medical devices. and how it may play into some of the things that were discussed earlier today. But the safest distance, I don't think you can get away from it. People who think that they can get away from cell phone break towers in today's day and age, you cannot get away from it. How far? You don't want to be living next to one, I don't think. I don't think at the same time, if you've got smart meters or if you have all these uh, routers now that look like a Klingon battle cruiser, these things with the antennas and that are blowing 5G all throughout your house, you know. So I suggest that people turn these things off. Really is the best way to do it within your home and in the area of workplace. And, you know, I have people say to me, well, you don't understand my situation. If I cut my phone off and I cut my router off, I'm going to miss a lot of messages coming in. I, I mean, I, I can't afford it. Well, it beats missing your next birthday. So, uh, you, isn't you, there a way to still hardwire your computer? You can, yes. Hardwiring is inconvenient, but you can do it. If you're going to use the router, some of the routers have the ability to uh, internally set a clock that cuts off at a certain time at night when you sleep because it's shooting it right through the walls. And with 5G on the way, 6G is now Apple's working on that, and the Chinese are working on 7G. So, I mean, they're so far ahead of us that you just, uh, the stuff that they're doing. But the first question was how far away. I can't give you a distance, but I can just say protect your own household as best you can. Many offices have Wi-Fi for the convenience of their patients. Uh, we do not. We just cut it off and say use your data minutes. We're not going to have that stuff buzzing around all inside my office. And so... The second question. So it, was, it is easy. It is safer to use a speakerphone then, because you have more distance. Yeah, if you keep it far enough away. But even these uh, self, the older style cell phones, you know, the ones that sit in the cradles that are charged, those things really put out a lot of energy. So, and remember that the further away you get from a cell tower, the more intense the antenna radiation is in your phone, because it's constantly looking for a signal. If you got the two bars and you got it sitting up here wanting to talk to mommy, uh, you're getting a head full of radiation. So that's my sort of long answer to a very short question. Yeah. Um, I bought it on Amazon for like 150 bucks. And if, if I put it about uh, half an inch away from this smartphone, it starts registering. If the smartphone's on, it starts reading. Uh, if I call the smartphone, it goes off the charts. Yes. But if I move, if I call the smartphone and the thing's about, uh, I want to say, 18 inches away, it doesn't register on my little meter. 
So there's a distance that in that particular case, you yeah, can I mean, get, you can get, you can pull it apart, you can get see it away. The thing go it's away. kind of hard to talk out here like this with one of those guys, but for the most part, especially with uh, these, I was just wondering, maybe my meter's not so good. Or something. Yeah, you need to measure all the way around it. Of course, most homes now, these new smart televisions, you've got a router that's shooting the information to your television set, and you're sitting in the den, and you're between the router and the TV. And you wonder why you, your heart goes irregular, why you're getting a, a heart arrhythmia from it. And you move away from it, and it stops. So to me, we're dealing with a very complex issue here, which I, it's just beyond my pay grade, some of this stuff that's going on in this field. So, and its implications for other types of uh, problems that people experience, you know, from the exposure to this radiation, you know. so. But yeah, you can get it safe. Just don't stick it in your ears. Put it in your lap. Stick it in your chest. And put it in your back pocket. And everywhere that people wear these phones, just try not to do it. Yeah. Part, not in the bras. Yeah. I like to put it on yes. airplane mode if I have it on my body. Yeah, it's still interrogating you. Oh, really? The, the tower okay. is still trying to find you. Well, the tower's working, but my yeah, phone's the, yeah, not Yeah, yeah, the phone is not, but yeah. the tower is still beaming out stuff. Do you know what the mechanism of action is, how it, how it causes the injury? I've heard it's through calcium gate channels. It's one of the ways. The other way is what we discussed was microwave poration, the ability to expand cellular membranes, open them up, mm -hmm. and let stuff in that's not supposed to get in there. Which, which is some of the research done by uh, Dr. Meg Sears and others. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting topic. Mm. And we need to be talking to each other about this kind of stuff. In my office, we have a questionnaire about their cell phone use, particularly if we're contemplating metallic restorations. There's so much stuff we put in the mouth, you can't believe it. Cobalt, chromium, and cobalt and chromium, and platinum, and, and, and zirconium, and nickel and whatever. God, I mean, you know, it's amazing what's in the mouth. Michael, here's another question for you. I'm Mike Margolis from uh, Arizona. And you started talking about the two different vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna. Yes. And you talked about 5G and you showed how these First, it's not a vaccine. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to be attenuated from any form of uh, cellular uh, debris. But you showed that once the 5G or once the mechanism opened up, everything went flying everywhere. And that scares the juvie out of me because what's that going to do to our immune systems for those who uh, haven't researched these vaccinations and just blindly like sheep? gotten these vaccinations. Yeah, well, of course, that sort of thing is, is again, beyond my pay grade. But what I can tell you is that if, if microwave exposure is increasing cell, cell membrane permeability, then you have a problem with distribution of these products, particularly if they have a medical device component to them, which we discussed in, the, in there, that some of these vaccines have a little bit of a medical device flavor to them. They're artificial. Uh, they, they're really the Mac vaccines are largely biologics, of course. But um, there is a medical device component that's on the horizon for these, meaning that that contains metallic and other types of artificial devices for delivery of drugs, vaccines, all that sort of thing. So, I'm interested in anything that keeps those cells membranes intact, and that's usually one of the major problems that we face with the ingress of toxins and so forth is cell cell membrane permeability. So that's what we were talking about. Okay. Um, MIT just got a patent for a tracer that when you get a vaccine, you would be able to put your, or you put your hand underneath the machine and it will show if you've had the uh, vaccine. Any comment on that? Well, what I do know about it is that the compound is called luciferase. Nice name, isn't it? 
It's what comes out of lightning bugs. And it's called luciferase. Whoever came up with that name maybe ought to be thrown in the ditch, but nonetheless, that's the name of the product that will fluoresce when interrogated. I believe that's what you're, you're asking about. Again, I'm not a vaccine expert, only as it relates to my work with the FDA on medical devices, you know, and how they impact health and lose their substrate under certain conditions. That's what concerns me about anything that's introduced artificially is whether or not the body is going to be able to tolerate the product. I have a really silly question. I'm a nurse, and I heard that you, you said you were taping your mouth. So I don't know. Are you taping it this way, or how are you how are you taping your mouth, and what tape do you use so you don't get sick? Uh, it's, it's very simple. I heard Patrick, I heard Patrick speak uh, ten years ago there, or thereabouts, and that's when I decided to do it. Because I'd have a wet pillow. Hundred percent of the mornings of my life, when I was a kid, I'd wake up with a wet pillow. I started out just using paper tape because it barely has any adhesion at all. And if you think, oh my gosh, I can't breathe in the middle of the night, and you're going to have a big problem, forget it. Your mouth will come open, the tape will come off. It is not dangerous, even minutely. I would just put one piece across here, but I don't do it anymore because I, what, what happened for me, I mean, I, I have more room. I expanded my maxilla seven millimeters 30 years ago, but I still need more room. I wish I'd done more. I, my tongue is still kind of between my teeth and I'll have some, some saliva will kind of leak between my lips and it'll be captured behind the tape. And for whatever reason, I end up getting a, a cold sore there now and again. So I got smart and I go here, it starts way up here, clear down to here, clear to here, earplugs in, mask on, that's the way Bill Hanks sleeps. I mean, it's pretty weird. I don't know why my wife stays with me anymore. I wouldn't give her an idea to leave, but it's, it works. I mean, I've literally gone two years without a cold and there was never a time when I wouldn't have a cold a couple of years. Uh, and I've done it. I've the biggest thing is even when you're going to nap, and I've done this, on the first flight I did, I went to Sydney, Australia, the first time I ever taped on an airplane overnight. My God, I got halfway across the Pacific Ocean. I looked down, we're gone seven hours, and I hadn't slept seven hours. I never sleep seven hours in a row, but it was taped, and I did. Myotape. Patrick McCune from Galway, Ireland, who has the book, the Oxygen Advantage, and we know him very well. He's coming out with a brand new book that's going to have a U.S. version come out this summer, The Breathing Cure. He has a myotape, which is a little elastic thing that goes around the lips here, and you, it's a square. So if, you're, if you have a mother that's worried that her child is going to vomit and aspirate that, no problem, because it's, it's elastic, and you pull it up here, pull it out here, pull it out here, and it just basically pulls the lips together like that. So if you were sick, vomit, it's, it's all gone. But you'll be amazed. I have one, one of the greatest lessons I had. One of, I was treating a 72-year-old woman who's never smiled in her life. She's totally sour, sour puss. And I don't know why I was treating her. I didn't like having her in there. She, she could, she'd look out at sunny Southern California. She'd see a cloud and it'd be a bad day. I got her to tape her mouth. <laughs> and she came in one time with a smile on her face. And she said, man, I'm sleeping better. I've told all my friends about this. You'll, you'll be amazed at how many people will do it and how well they'll feel. I mean, Michael and Joy, they, I'm sure they have their stories. I, I, I tape every night with two-inch paper tape micropore this way. Or sometimes I'll use the chin-up strips that, that's FDA approved. It's developed by a cardiologist. The point I'm trying to make with children, little children, you don't want to put a piece of tape over their lips. You put it on your lips, and you say, boy, this is fun. It's sticky paper, and you let them do it because you don't want to start any psychological trauma, uh, you know, with little kids. Under five, I don't really tape at all except for Patrick's myotape. And, you know, patients love it. I always have them kind of bring their lower lip up to the upper lip, and that's helping the airway even more. Remember the... With the mouth open, the mandible drops back. Dr. Buteko knew that 
people before they died all mouth breathed even more and their mouth was open wide like that so you just think it's you get more air you get more oxygen who knows one more really good <coughs> selling point that you can take take something positive out of a pandemic and say look what a great opportunity you have you don't want to get covid fine in your nose you have nitric oxide which kills bacteria and viruses going down so if you're a nasal breather, you're more likely to resist that. Mouth breathing, it's not there. I've had many people, that really catches them on fire. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, great. Definitely tape, tape, tape. And I, I have them tape under the mask even when they find they can breathe through their nose. It's called mask mouth. Mouth. Mask mouth, mm -hmm. because people are wearing masks so often and they're they're obstructing their, I don't know, but they're breathing through their mouths more. So we've been trying to instruct people to make sure that they breathe through their nose and, and hydrate themselves. But I never thought of putting tape, you know. Mm -hmm. They could do that. Of course, it's you can't do it where you want. Because the mask actually pulls the mandible down. Yes. And so if they put a piece of tape, just a little piece of tape here. Okay doesn't hurt anything. Then I had a question he asked, too, about the training, the myofacial, tr the training that we could get. Yeah. Can you kind of um, explain that? It's, on, it's online from what I yeah, understand. Yeah, it's about six weeks. It's not s straight six weeks. She does a couple hours here, a couple hours there. Um, there's about, there's two speech pathologists, myself, a physical two physical therapists, um, sleep doctor, um, a TMJ specialist, um, and it's over a period of time. We have four courses. The intro course is enough to get started, and then we also have the breathing course where Patrick comes and does um, three or four days, and then we have it, the TMJ sleep and posture, and then one on cleanups, just on cleanups. So if you go to aomtinfo.org, you'll see it. They're all virtual now. Pardon? Yes, AOMT, Academy of Orofacial Myofunctional Therapy. Just it just occurred to me, um, you know, have you guys noticed with uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients, they're doing this all the time. They have their mouth open. All have you have you noticed that? Is that secondary or primary? It's common for everybody, not just Alzheimer's. No, no, no. They're gross. You know, you know who's doing it now is Bill Clinton. If you watch Bill Clinton. He's got that look. It's different. It's you, this is a different look that you don't normally see in an adult. You know, I, I think some of the research for Alzheimer's and and dementia is showing a buildup of the beta amyloid plaque in in the brain, um, and so they're looking for a vaccine or some sort of magical drug to give these patients to to you know blast out that buildup of the beta amyloid plaque. Well, if you go on a very simplistic way and look at when does brain detox occur? and it occurs in REM sleep, where the brain actually decreases in swelling and flushes out beta amyloid plaque, perhaps the, um, you know, the increase in Alzheimer's and uh, dementia that we're seeing is not gonna be cured by a, a magical shot or drug. Perhaps it's a lifestyle change, and it starts, again, I think we've made this point clear, it starts very early on with proper breathing techniques. So, um, you know, the earlier you start, the more properly they're oxygenated. If they never, um, if they have oxygen desaturation consistently through the night that I showed a case today where the kid was desatting to 62%, then of course he's gonna have disrupted sleep patterns. He's never gonna reach that REM level of sleep. He's gonna be a constant, a constant circle of suffocation and compensa compensation uh, to stay alive. So if he never gets into that REM sleep, they're never gonna have that brain flush that allows the, um, the detox and the flushing of the beta amyloid plaque. So 
um, you know, Hillary's probably keeping Bill up at night these days um, for that specific. No, I'm teasing. But um, I think there is absolutely a direct uh, correlation and, and potentially um, if, if you look at that generation of baby boomers that have it, if you look back at when they were children and what they were doing, somewhere along the line we started wearing the badge of being busy as the, you know, the most important thing. I'm the busiest. I stay up the latest. I'm the stressed, most stressed. And if we could transition that into – you know, it's cool to be rested. It's cool to be oxygenated. Um, it might shift the, the lifestyle and the decisions we make. Does anybody else have any questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you, guys. We're done. Oh, wait, wait. She decided she's not shy. Um, is it Hi guys, um, is there any way to track your sleep um, that is accurate and that you know exactly like what is your oxygen level uh, at night? I mean, if you are really having sleep apnea, because one time I had a, a sleep study, but I mean, the thing came off my my body in the middle of the night and then, you know, they said, oh yeah, you have sleep apnea, which I don't doubt that I have, but um you know, it was very hard for me to u utilize a CPAP machine and be compliant. Um, so I, I think there's, and I'll just answer this briefly and pass it on. I think there's various ways to measure if there is oxygen desaturation which or sleep disturbance, which would give you a diagnosis of sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing, regardless of how slight or severe it might be. Um, I, I definitely understand a non-compliance with a CPAP. They're not comfortable. You're really pretty, and they're, you know, to have that big old machine on your pretty face, you know, is kind of awkward. So I understand that. You know, there's there's all kinds, and I and I maybe this would be echoed by others on the stage. I feel like there's a lot of debate on what the best measure of that would be, whether it's a PSG and hospital sleep test, you know, the brand of home sleep test that doctors or dentists can use as screening tools. Um, I think the, the market, uh, even if you get on Amazon and search, you know, sleep evaluation, there's some different um, tools there. There's a ring you can wear. I forget them blanking on the name of it, but there's. Yeah, yeah. Yes, oh, or, a or a ring, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's different Fitbits, Apple watches, all, all types of things. How exact it is, I don't know, but it definitely shows if, if there's a disturbance and, you know, high percentage of CPAP wearers are failures. So I would look for a, a, a oral appliance friendly. Um, you know, doctor or dentist who could help you with that for sure. I just want to get back to the question about oximetry. So remember the, the thin women and most women are not going to have really a lot of oxygen desats. It'll be 0.3. One. It's not an issue. They don't have apnea. They have disturbed sleep. So when you get apnea, it goes one of two ways. Either oxygen desats or sleep fragmentation, and different with interthoracic pressure, and what that does to the organs, which we haven't even discussed. So don't rely just on oximetry. And I know people like METS, there's people that love oximetry. They can read into it. They can read the, the pulse rate and have the So we're really looking at autonomics. WatchPad 1, just of interest, is a good one because the Bluetooth can come back. It's disposable. So if we ever have anything like this, so don't you don't have to ship the unit back. So a unit like a WatchPad One, it'll it'll come to you. I know it's not good for our, for the you know electromagnetic, but you don't have to get the unit back. It's disposable, and there's other ones coming out like Night Owl. We like the WatchPad because it's very sensitive. Like Zaji says, the autonomics are picked up very well with the WatchPad. It, a study just came out saying they overread a little bit. It's a little bit higher than it really should be. But don't get carried away just with oxygen. There's a lot more to the effects on your body than oxygen desat. Hope that helps. Any more questions? Anybody ready for dinner? <laughs> well, let's thank our panel of speakers one more time and we'll see you all tomorrow